Welcome everyone to Real Estate Investing Reimagined with Brian Daly, co-founder and CEO of Ground Floor, and myself, Chris Lestrino, founder and CEO of King's Crowd. Um, for those that don't know King's Crowd, we're an independent rating and analytics service for this new online startup investing market. And as part of that, we like to highlight the best companies we identify through our in-house, in-depth due diligence process. So during today's webinar, we'll get to hear from Brian Daly, who's one of our favorite founders uh, right now, who's raising capital, and be able to get your questions answered about the current investment opportunity in the company. Um, you'll also have a chance to ask questions to Brian. Um, so please, you know, right away, start entering your questions. That way I make sure I can prioritize them and get them in um, during this 30-minute call. And with that, Brian, I'd love to kind of kick it off and have you do a two to three minute pitch on yourself and the ground floor business. Sure. Great to be with you, Chris. And uh, everybody, thanks for taking time to join us. Uh, we started Ground Floor six years ago with a pretty simple idea, which is there's a whole class of investments out there, and I know people tuned into this webinar get it. Uh, there's a whole class of investments out there that 96, 98% of us don't have access to, and they're some of the best, most lucrative investments. Uh, if you could have owned Lyft before their IPO, wouldn't that have been amazing? Uh, but the truth is not only the stocks that you read about, but there are other private investments out there in the world that due to a, honestly, it's, it's not just due to securities law, but due to the way that securities law is set up and some of the economics uh, of investing, uh, most of us haven't had access to these types of investments. We set out six years ago to change that. Uh, we quickly identified real estate as a big opportunity because the truth is at, a, at some point in our lives, the vast majority of us are going to become real estate investors in single family housing uh, because most of us are gonna own a house at some point. Uh, whether because of house flipping shows or uh, hearing about your friend who made some money on rental property, most people have the idea that investing in real estate is a good thing. What we set out to do that is still unique to this day is to give people the opportunity to build diversified portfolios of real estate investments that are actually good for them and where they have the control. The reason this product has been so popular and now has, well, last year we sold $50 million of securities uh, to individual investors. Uh, the reason it's been so popular is because it pays a very high yield, 10 to 12% on a very short term of about eight to 10 months, typically. Uh, you know, as much as 12 months, if, if one of the loans takes longer to repay, it might take a year and a half, or in a foreclosure state, it could take two years but that is still an outstanding hold period uh, for, it, for a, an investment with that kind of yield and with the security that you get with a piece of real estate uh, underneath it. And today we have thousands of investors uh, with portfolios that contain dozens or even hundreds of loans. Uh, we publish all the statistics on our blog for those people who are interested. And it's just been an amazing uh, growth story. Uh, it took a long time to get started. Uh, because there's a lot of securities law work to do to make it possible. Uh, but here we are today, uh, six years later, uh, now entering a, a very aggressive growth stage. Awesome. Yeah, I give you a lot of credit for making it through the, uh, the regulatory hurdles of even getting this thing to go um, to start. So to your point around this diversification idea, one thing I've noticed as a ground floor user, so for, for anyone who's watching the webinar, um, I'm both an investor in ground floor from the last round, and I've been using the platform for the past two and a half years um, as an investor in the loans. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed is that the deal flow has really increased over the past six to 12 months where you know, it used to be maybe once in a while you get a batch of new uh, loans that were available for investment and now I'm seeing them all the time. Um, so how have you been able to increase the deal flow for investors? Well, the trick, right? It turns out, and people who are entrepreneurs and have tried to sell a product know, know this, the trick is always to figure out how to sell your product. But the thing is with, with, when your product is money, uh, it's not a hard product to sell. It's a hard product to, to sell to the people you want to buy it. And so it took us a long time to build up a, um, an origination funnel uh, and an origination process that could reliably do that uh, at scale with a growth rate without reducing loan quality. And I'll, uh, for the best measure of that, uh, you can go to our blog and we, we publish uh, a cohort analysis that shows uh, how each sort of vintage has performed sort of before we really um, kind of had, had were able to afford having the right kind of staff, the real estate people and the, the expertise and it built sort of built, had the battle scars of 
of, of being a lender, which can be a hard business. And the before and after of that is incredible. I mean, volume since then has tripled or quadrupled. Uh, you know, quality has increased incredibly, uh, you know, by almost every measure. Uh, if, if you look at how much of the credit repays on time, if you look at the loss ratio, if you look at almost anything, uh, it has just gotten better as we've grown. So that's, I think that's been an important part of the growth story that we've been able to do it. We didn't grow too fast like a lot of lenders did. A lot of lenders went out and they said, oh, I'm just gonna lend a bunch of money. I'm gonna impress the venture capitalists and I'm gonna grow really fast. And we've seen some of those platforms frankly fail uh, because they've had asset management problems. So we, we've been more conservative in that regard. Um, you know, you can always be better of course, but we've, we've invested very heavily in asset management, very carefully in underwriting. And that's why we've been able to grow. Uh, the way that we have. Awesome. So to that point on the investor side, so going away from the loans, but actual to the investors, many of the original peer-to-peer -peer lenders like a lending club, which weren't in real estate, um, but have moved away from really going after the retail investors. Not that it doesn't exist. They just, that's not what they're pushing anymore, right? They go more after the institutional dollars right. because it's more cost efficient. So do you think you'll continue to rely heavily on the retail investor or will you move to kind of go more the institutional way? So we've, we have tinkered with institutional investors and we've actually been qualified now by three or four buyers of this credit who have come in and audited us on site over time to say that our underwriting standards, our processes for originating loans, our asset management standards are institutional grade. And that's no accident because we hired an executive early on uh, to build uh, an underwriting risk management uh, origination and asset management practice that that is the, at that grade. Our mission, though, is is for the individual investor. I didn't wake up in the morning, uh, you know, six years ago and think the world needs another real estate lending company. Uh, I didn't wake up in the morning thinking, uh, boy, there's a really big opportunity, and there may be. There are other companies who do this uh, in facilitating transactions between big private equity investors or ultra high net worth investors, or even uh, just accredited investors alone uh, and real estate sponsors. I, that, that wasn't our mission in the early days. It's not gonna become our mission. We're here for the individual investor and we have lots of plans to create lots more product uh, for the individual investor. And we actually think not only is it a more differentiated business, uh, but we actually think it's strategically more profitable uh, in the long term. And so it's been hard because We've seen other platforms grow really fast with institutional capital, but we don't believe those are long-term sustainable, high margin plays. Uh, and, and so we're gonna stay on our current course. So I'm curious to hear uh, why you think uh, you'll end up achieving even more profitability by going this route, which seems more labor intensive on the front end. Well, you don't have to be a student of Michael Porter, uh, the famous competition and strategy professor at Harvard Business School to understand the dynamics of supplier power. Uh, and buyer power. Uh, if you have suppliers who are the big money, they have the gold, they make the rules, uh, and you'll see this in a downturn, you'll definitely see it in a downturn, uh, they can pull back, and when they pull back, contrary to conventional wisdom, they actually pull back as a herd. So mm -hmm. institutional investors usually act in lockstep. It's the rare institutional investor who breaks from the herd. Uh, it's, a, it's a great risk to do that, and we know some, uh, who do, and that's great. But by and large, we think the, the power that we have to do the right thing by our borrower, you know, in, a, in the case of a foreclosure or a workout, to build products that are uniquely suited for the borrower uh, is better because of our position. If you look at our portfolio, it's funded by, each loan is funded by hundreds of investors uh, who themselves are spreading their investment across hundreds of loans. Sure. So that means that there's not so much tied up in any one loan. Uh, there's something tied up in the system and in the underwriting algorithm and in the practice, but we have a lot of freedom uh, to design product and therefore to create more value. And that's what we've done. I mean, the most popular feature of our credit product with borrowers is this deferred payment product. Nobody else offers it because nobody else sources their crap from retail and nobody else can create sort of the same effect of ongoing yield and liquidity for retail investors that we can because of how that's structured. It's a non-obvious insight. It's not one that, you know, everybody in this space understands, but I, you know, we, we, 
we thought it might be true. Now we know it's true. Yeah. You know, I've been selling the product for five or six years. Awesome. So from a customer acquisition standpoint, do you have a sense of cu customer acquisition costs on the retail investor side? And also would love to understand what does a retail investor look like who's utilizing the ground floor platform? Well, I'll tell you, our, our retail investors, when we first started, we had to go out on Facebook. Uh, we could only sell securities in the state of Georgia. This was for our first year and a half of operation. We we're piloting it and prototyping. And, you know, we would pay 20, 30, 40 dollars per investor. And there's no way that's worth that, right? I mean, you couldn't do that over the long term, but we had to do that to get to critical mass. And so that was a barrier to entry for us and for anybody else because it looks kind of nonsensical. Today, we don't pay to acquire investors by, by and large. Uh, we will sometimes just to experiment or to test, uh, but we really grow organically. Uh, and that's a great thing. So we're, we're now at the stage where the product kind of sells itself. We have a fantastic customer uh, referral program that works really well, where we're able to give somebody $10 to try it and $10 to reward them for making the effort. And that seems to be working really, really well for acquisition for us. And what is your, uh, on the other side, what does your core loan customer look like? So who's coming to you and asking for a loan? Yeah, and I apologize. I didn't answer the part about the profile of the investor. And, and one of the reasons for that is the investor is actually segmented more psychographically than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, the demographics are across the board, accredited versus non-accredited. It looks like America. I love that. Um, nice. Yeah. On the borrower side, uh, we also have a broad spectrum of borrowers. Um, the meat of the, of, of, so our business last year was 50% repeat borrower. Now we actually think as we get better at lending and managing, that's going to rise to about 75 to 80% repeat. And we actually already saw that in Q1. We haven't released our Q1 results yet, but as a little preview, uh, we saw quite a jump from, uh, we, we actually, in, in a Q1, Q1 is usually a, a lower quarter in lending, in real estate lending. And so we really went to our repeat borrowers to see if we could drive business. And we actually managed to originate at about the same level as Q4, just mm -hmm. by turning uh, the crank on uh, repeat borrowers. Uh, so we think there's a lot of upside there. Um, we like uh, real estate entrepreneurs, independent real estate entrepreneurs who, whether they're home builders or whether they're renovators or, you know, who, you know, do this as a full-time or, you know, ex extensively part-time kind of avocation. Um, and we like people who are doing 10 to 20 house flips uh, a year, and we want to have more than our fair share of those uh, coming to us. Awesome. So, and I, I had a question coming from the crowd and it actually kind of lines up with my next question for you. So some would say that, you know, the home flipping loan uh, asset class is a riskier asset class. One, what happens in a recession? And two, if you have loans that go into default, what happens to a ground floor loan once it goes into default? What are you doing to protect and take care of the investor? So we have a, the first thing we do happens long before we make the loan. So the most important thing we do in the process is we, uh, we first of all audit experience. So we know we're dealing with experienced, or if we're not dealing with an experienced, uh, you know, entrepreneur, that we price that accordingly. So you know that that's going to cost them a grade or two, you know, for the leverage, and they can't get as much leverage. So there's more room for them to you know make mistakes, if you will. So that's number one. Uh, second thing we do uh, early on is we collect a, what we call a scope of work uh, and a draw schedule. Now we once we make the loan, we're managing them to that. We're not just waiting to see whether they repay or not, or did they make a monthly payment if it's a monthly payment loan. We're actually looking to see, you know, what they said they would do, what their plan was, and did they follow up and actually implement their plan? And if not, why not? So that's a proactive asset management practice that we engage in uh, that I think makes a really big difference for investors. By the way, we don't charge investors for that. Uh, that's just part of our business. Uh, and that's something that, you know, if, if you're making 10% on your loan, uh, that's because the borrower is paying 10% on their loan. And, and we're, our asset management team is in there trying to make sure we get every dollar. Now, if it goes into default, and sometimes we will place it into default. Sometimes people look at our default rates and they're like, oh my gosh, that sounds very high. That's actually a really good thing. Because we walk into a default situation strategically. And we say, wait a minute, we have to have an aggressive path 
to resolve this situation if you don't if you don't work it out with us and you don't have a new plan and you're not accountable then we're going to go the legal route and we become very adept at you know sort of taking possession of these properties and then selling them and then returning investor capital you know sometimes at at, at a higher rate than was promised uh, which is great the third thing we do is we control leverage so in a downturn um, there are two ways to get burned. <laughs> One is with leverage and two is with liquidity. So we control the leverage and we control the liquidity to complete the project. Um, if you control the, le the leverage properly and the way you measure that is, you, in fact, we, we're soon going to publish a study that we just did, a statistical study that shows the value that we predicted, the after repair value in relation to the actual sale price. And we are typically within about 3% of that figure uh, on average. And that's an extraordinarily good record. Uh, that's, that's actually good news for our borrowers too, because they always think that their project is gonna be worth more. And then we have to have this hard conversation with them to say, that's not a realistic exit valuation. You're probably not gonna get there. And here's what that means for your profitability. We don't want them to do unprofitable deals, right? We actually yep. calculate their, their projected profitability. And in fact, they have to meet a minimum profitability in order for us to do the deal. Uh, so we want them to make a profit, there to be a cushion. Uh, and so that all goes into the underwriting that I think, and I think in a downturn, because we hold back funds for the renovation, we know the borrower isn't gonna run out of cash to complete it. And then on the pricing side, because the credit is so short term, and because we're operating, you know, the other great thing about our model that's different from most is we're operating in a part of the market that's at or below the median. Hmm. Well, that's a great place to be in most markets because that's not where you see most of the price pressure. What right. you really see is more of a days on market extension, right? Where it sits on the market longer, but you don't see as much price compression at those levels. So that, that's a combination of things that we do all the time and that I think will really help us in a downturn too. Terrific. So another question that actually came in from the crowd, but aligns with my next question for you too is, so today you offer, you know, these home flipping loans. Sounds like you're starting to do a little bit of construction loans as well. What other investment products do you want to offer? And from the crowd, will you get into commercial real estate as well? So we have, um, we've thought carefully. I mean, it's a, it's an important moment in a startup's life when you start to broaden from your core focus. The truth is we can build a very large company uh, you know, just doing uh, house flips. That is, a, it is an enormous market. Only one third of house flippers actually borrow for their projects today. That's been growing at a pretty good clip every year, according to market data we've seen. And the market is so enormous, it's a 60 to $70 billion lending market. We can get to profitability and beyond just in that market. The truth is, is we look at our customers and they start to think about the economy turning, they're rotating into some other sectors or as they make progress as a real estate entrepreneur, they want to take us with them. So we have a borrower here in Atlanta who started off doing a couple of house flips, but has already moved into some rental product. He wants to renovate the rental product. We can loan him the money for that, but now we're getting into, can we loan him the money to stabilize that or to fund that for a while? Uh, and so that's, a, you know, we're really following our customers and for startups, that's usually the healthiest thing to do. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you don't want to, just go do something because it's a new shiny object. You really want to do it because there's more customer value to be mined. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are also some segments that we're interested in in certain markets like, you know, new home construction. We've dabbled with that a little bit. But I, I think, you know, commercial, possibly. It, I think eventually we'll get there. We'll do it. There's some people on staff who are really itching to do it. There's some customers who want to take us there. So I won't say no, uh, you know, I'll just say it's a matter of when, uh, not if. Got it. Um, so one of the things that you talked about is being proactive about, you know, before things go into default, following up with them and all of these things sound really good from a quality perspective. Um, but from a scale perspective, it sounds pretty labor intensive. So how are you managing to keep costs low in order to scale the business? So the good thing about real estate lending that we've learned is that the borrowers are accustomed to paying the costs of the loan. Uh, so when you go and do an inspection, the borrower is paying for that. It shows up on the HUD. Uh, when we do a draw, there's a fee for that draw. And we don't seek to make big margins on that part of the business, but it covers the, you know, what we earn in that part of the business mostly covers the costs. 
Um, the part where it gets difficult for us is when it moves into foreclosure and we have to come out of pocket as a company and working capital with that. And the way we manage that quite transparently and we, we issue a statement showing exactly what we did, we charge fees to resolve those foreclosures. Uh, and we recapture our legal fees there as well. And so that's, that's the way that we have managed to variableize the revenue with those costs. Yep. But, you know, we have uh, two and a half people that manage a portfolio of about 400 loans. Uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, maybe we own five properties, four or five properties at, at any given time, and they're able to manage those as well. It's not a terrific burden, and we think we know how to scale that part of the business pretty well. Uh, from another expansion standpoint, you know, you started off basically in Atlanta, um, in Georgia, and how many states are you in today and, and how challenging is it to continue to expand across all 50 states? So today we sell securities in all 50 states. Uh, there may be one or two instances where there are specific securities laws where we pause it or, you know, buyer beware, like I think in Nebraska or something. Uh, it's a state where they have some some different rules where it's hard to sell these reggae offerings. Um, so, but we can sell securities nationwide uh, with that possible exception, maybe some others sometimes. Um, as for lending, we pick and choose our markets. So we have, uh, you know, when we were first qualified to sell securities across the country, we wanted to provide a broad array of geographic choice. Well, that meant that we had to go and lend in a lot of places online but we couldn't get too deep in any one place because then we'd be over concentrated. Today right. we're big enough where we can afford some concentration. And if people watch our 2000 uh, or February investor presentation available on our website, you'll see we have a strategy to expand lo into deep local markets. And that strategy I think will ultimately get us to all 50 states because uh, there's good lending to do everywhere. Uh, it's just a question of in what order, uh, you know, at what on what time timeline uh, but we're, we're planning to experiment with about three markets in addition to Atlanta this year with that model and yeah. if that works I think the way that we think it will uh, will be much more aggressive next year great but again that's why we're that's why we raise growth capital right no, absolutely. So I, I know we talked about a year ago um, and you had just formed kind of this relationship with direct access capital for a hundred yes. million dollar debt facility. Um, how has that helped you scale the business and are you going to continue to look for um, more of these types of debt facilities to help expand the business? So that facility is a uh, whole loan purchase flow program and it's interesting, you know what I said about uh, institutional buyers of credit sort of changing their mind and having a lot of power in, in it. Uh, midway through the year, direct access capital took a pause for their own reasons. Uh, and so we weren't actually flowing much. We had to do it all at retail, frankly. Uh, it was pretty daunting, you know, and we had to go out and acquire retail investors and because we were hitting our origination targets, but we had to keep up with retail investing. So it was exciting because we love growing the retail base, right? But it's also, it takes time and sometimes can take some expense if you have to do it fast. Uh, organic growth is slow. Uh, so we actually have now put uh, relationships in place with a couple others so I don't think are announced, uh, but one of them, for example, in December bought uh, a couple million dollars from us of credit. Uh, it seems like they're on about a million dollars a month now that we're able to flow to them. And we just want to have, for larger loans that it would be difficult for us to sell at retail, we want to have that as an option, right, as an offtake option so that we can grow revenue, grow the origination capacity, uh, while we patiently grow the retail base. So it's a, it's a balancing act for sure. No, absolutely. So I, I have a ton of questions that have flowed in both from emails and I, we have questions all over the place, but we'll try and get as many answered as possible. Um, so one of the questions that came in is that you mentioned that investors get the same rate as, as the borrowers pay. Does that right. mean that all your fixed and variable costs and margins are all paid by fees charged to the borrowers? Correct. Excellent. There we go. Um, next question, what are the advantages to investing in ground floor stock versus funding loans? It's a very different investment, uh, very different return profile. With ground floor loans, you are picking and choosing individual loans. You're saying, I'm going to lend out my money for a year. I'm going to earn a fixed rate of return. It's like if I loaned you money, Chris, you know, I would come calling a year from now and ask for my $5 plus interest back, right? Uh, that's the nature of a ground floor investment in loans. A, an investment in the company stock is a very different investment. That is a startup investment. 
Startups are very risky investments. It's a riskier asset class. Uh, we think that the return, because of the risk is higher, the return that you're rewarded with should be higher. But I'll also tell you when you invest in equity, especially in startup equity, the time horizon to earn that return is longer. So it really depends on who you are as an investor and what your goals are. I wouldn't compare the two uh, and consider how much to put in each. I would I'd say if I have the risk tolerance to invest in a startup, and I am looking for that kind of return with a portion of my portfolio, then I will do that. But know that it could be you know, three years, five years, 10 years to get a return on that investment. Now you're shooting for the moon, you're shooting for a really high return, right? At this level, right. you can get a two, two X, three X, five X return. We don't know yet. It, it's very uncertain to invest in startups, even at the growth stage, even at the scaling stage. It's not uncertain to invest in ground floor LROs. That's a much more, and that's why we started with that kind of investment as a, as a company. We right. wanted to build a, an investment that we knew uh, would, would fill a gap in people's portfolio that nobody else is filling, quite frankly. REITs don't fill it, uh, you know, not, nothing really fills it out there. Bonds don't fill it. It, it's, it's, it is a white space for individual investors. So. Definitely, there's a ton of uncertainty with investing in startups. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, but in terms of, you know, as you think five years, 10 years down the road, an exit opportunity for investors, it's, it's come in a few times now. What do the exit opportunities look like? How do you kind of think about that um, from your perspective? Because of the way that we've grown up as a company, the most enticing exit opportunity is an IPO, right? We have such a broad base of shareholders now that as we build the company over time and, and as quickly as we can grow it, now we have to do that profitably, uh, but if we can grow it profitably over time, an IPO would be possible to a company like this, for a company like this, and that would be very exciting. Uh, that's a longer time horizon than an acquisition, right? Sure. And I'm not gonna say an acquisition wouldn't happen, but I'm just, we're just trying to build a valuable company. Uh, and we trust that the right acquisition or IPO opportunity will be out there on the horizon if we do a good job as a management team on that. We have a track record as a management team of growing this business. Uh, this year, we're really focused on getting it close to profitability, if not there, uh, because we think that's a, that's a true test of growing a long-term sustainable business. And if we do that, uh, I think a lot of options are going to open up for us. Uh, we're not seeking to be acquired, but I could imagine us fitting well within uh, you know, the, the, the balance sheet or the assets of a lot of different financial services companies out there, uh, you know, for the right price, for the right situation. We will right. never give up on our mission, though. Our mission for the individual investor is sacrosanct. I love that. that. That's incredibly important for your differentiation, 100%. Um, one of the questions that's being asked is around kind of the regulatory side. So um, they say ground floor sets itself apart by allowing the everyday retail investor to participate in its loan offerings. To do so, it needs to have these loans qualified by the SEC. As I understand it, during the recent government shutdown, it was unable to do so as the SEC was closed. So how is ground floor able to continue to sell loans during this time? And going forward, how does ground floor ground floor imagine the split between the sale of loans to retail versus non-retail? So we operate on the bleeding edge of securities law. We always have. Uh, when we got, you know, when Nick and I six years ago called up half a dozen law firms to try to get them to work with us, almost all of them told us that it wouldn't work, uh, that Nick's regulatory vision wasn't practical. Uh, when 18 months later, we actually did it, a lot of people in the industry said it was a publicity stunt. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't going to work in the long term. It was made no economic sense. Uh, that was the criticism then. Um, yes, it, we're on the bleeding edge of regulatory, uh, you know, rules and regulations and, and and statutes. That's okay with us. We're very comfortable operating in that space. We understand how to navigate it. Uh, we we did experience a disruption with the government shutdown. You know, we are not done with our regulatory roadmap. Uh, we are on a roadmap. Uh, and it might be this year, it might be next year, we may qualify for a style of offering and a structure of offering that wouldn't put a government shutdown uh, in the way as a risk. But that's why we have the non-retail business. We were able to take our institutional partners and sell a pretty good package of credit to them that allowed us to keep going. 
Now we suffered a dip because we didn't know how long the government shutdown was going to last. Right. So we had to slow down and it hurt us for about six weeks. But our Q1 number is much stronger uh, than we thought it would be under those circumstances. So we're building a resilient company that understands how to operate at that sort of bleeding edge. And, you know, we're not done. You know, we got a lot of work still that we want to do to optimize this thing. Awesome. So I'll throw in one last question for you here um, before we kind of go offline. Um, as you think about this business kind of five years down the road, you know, where do you see it? How do you grow from a $50 million company today to something much larger than that? What's the plan? How do you get there? The, the plan, I think, today, what I have seen, just look, we ran a lot of experiments last year. So we took the capital that we raised, and this is what, you know, good startup teams do. We took the capital that we raised and we, in a very disciplined fashion, we put it to work on some experiments last year. We learned from those experiments. Uh, we think we have a very good go-to-market plan that we want to activate uh, this year and how quickly we activate it and at what scale we activate on it depends on how much capital we raise. Sure. Because every dollar we spend on that is working capital that we have to, you know, that we're losing more money and we're trying to drive this thing to a profitable level. So that's the dance you have to play. You have to, you have to, participate in as an entrepreneur when you're trying to grow the company uh, the key to getting this bigger is our local market strategy uh, once we perfect the execution of that and the economics of that I think there will be ground floor outposts all over the country uh, it could be the reinvention of community banking uh, that may be the future of what we of what we're doing here and that would be very exciting that would be a very large platform indeed uh, and that's you know time will tell where it, where it goes we are uh we're on the case though and, and very intent on getting this thing to be many multiples uh of the size it is today terrific well thank you brian this has been a really really fascinating discussion we still have a ton of questions what i think i'll do is i'll send them your way and we'll Great. see if we can work something out to kind of get some more of these answered for sure. everyone yeah. um, but it's been an absolute pleasure having everyone on we'll be sure to share this video after with everyone as well um, and so, you know, as we said, ground floor, we look at as one of the top deals in the market today that are available for investment that falls into our top five to 10% of bucket of the 300 to 500 companies that are live at any one time available for investment. So we really do think very highly of this team. Um, it's a great opportunity. You could check us out at kingscrowd.com. Uh, for the next hour, if you go to King's Crowd and use coupon code dollar king, uh, you'll get two months of access to King's Crowd to find other deals like ground floor for just a dollar. Um, we hope everyone really enjoyed the, the webinar and thank you so much for your, your thoughtful questions. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be in touch soon, Brian. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great All day. Right. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye.